Hi everyone, my name is Monique. And I'm Naveen from Before You Play, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Board Games, where we basically talk about board games. Yeah, that's right. We do a few uh, different reviews in one episode. Mm -hmm. We typically have a theme that usually connects all the games together, and so today we're talking about a few strategy games specifically. I think this is the first time that we've done a strategy-specific episode. That's right? right. Yeah, normally we like to do full playthroughs of them, obviously, mm -hmm. but you cannot get to all of the games because it just takes yes. that much time to do so. We literally cannot film playthroughs for every single strategy game, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we just kind of have to uh, talk about how we feel about that. Yep. And so today we're going to be talking about four different games. But before we get started, uh, we do have a shout out that we like to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're really surprised that uh, we haven't shouted them out before. Because sure. they're such this such a wonderful channel, and it is none other than Jeff and Jamie at Foster the Meeple. That's right. So we really love uh, Jeff and Jamie's channel because they are just two very genuine, you know, authentic people. They're really, really fun, entertaining to watch. They do a lot of uh, board game discussion videos. They do top ten lists and just talk about games that they've been playing, and they're just so fun to watch. Yeah, they have a good banter. They're kind people, and kind of what you see on video is who you get in real life, which mm -hmm. is great. And so if you're not familiar with their channel, there is a link in the description down below. You can always go check them out. Jeff and Jamie, thank you for everything that you do. All right. And by the way, we will be including timestamps to the different games that we'll be talking about in the description below. So if you're interested in jumping around, please feel free to do so. So the first game on our list today is one that was based off of a video game of the same name. Mm -hmm. And it is... It is Anno 1800, designed by Martin Wallace and published by Cosmos. It's mm -hmm. a two to four player Euro game for sure. Yes. Um, and like Monique said, it is based off of the video game, both of which we have not played. Oh, uh, I deeply want to play that game. We looked it up. It's not available for Mac yeah. after playing this game. This uh, is not a PC household. No, <laughs> we yeah. only have Macs here. And so unfortunately, this is a game that we cannot play, no. but I so deeply want to. We played this game with a friend who, uh, who, who does, who does love the game. Yeah. And she says that it, it seems like a very good thematic uh, port. And so if you're not familiar with the video game or this, the theme is based off of, a, I think it's your industrializing a co uh, colony of it's, islands. Uh, yeah, some sort of right? civilization. Yeah. yeah. You're definitely building industries and trying to populate the area with residents yep. is kind of what I gather from playing this game. Totally. And so the way that this game works in particular is there is a main board in the center of the table that has a bunch of tiles. Mm -hmm. And so just so you know, that's probably going to be the most tedious part of this game. If you don't have an insert, which thankfully we do have one, and uh, we'll include a link to where you can get our specific insert. By the way, it's off of Etsy. It's not ours. We didn't we didn't make this. No, Somebody no, else no. made it and, and made us aware of it. Yeah, they, they kindly sent us a copy of the mm. insert, by the way, and it is a lifesaver because it basically holds all the tiles and we can arrange the tiles in the order that they appear on the, on the board. Yes. But basically you have this menu of tiles in the middle of the board, and those are all different industries that we can build. Each player also has their own board where we're going to be building out these industries onto, but they're also pre-printed industries already on your player board. At the top of your board, you also have cubes of different colors and they represent different people like engineers, artisans, and uh, just people who are going to be working in your colony, I in suppose. In those different industries. And so on your turn, one of your main goals is to try to build out more of these industries onto your player board. And by the way, this game is a little bit difficult to describe without having it in, in out in you. front of you. Yeah. But uh, each industry that you want to build has a requirement in order to build it. Assuming you have the needed industries on your map already, you're using those workers by placing the cubes from the top of your board onto the industry spots yes. below your board. Oh, it's so difficult it's to explain. It's so difficult to explain with thing, but basically that that top bar where you have different colors of different types of yeah. workers, that's how you produce the goods. You yes. move those workers onto the industry, signifying, hey, it's in the tobacco plant, it's producing tobacco. But you're never producing resources and collecting resources right. like in a standard Euro game. Right. You're always placing those, uh, those cubes to produce the resources while you're developing an industry, right? right? So you never right. have any like leftover resources or anything. So the game kind of uh, forces you to think like, okay, well, that industry over there requires me to have milk. I don't have milk. Okay, so I need to build out the milk tile. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, the milk requires me to have co cotton and whatever Z, yeah. else. So you're basically going through this like chain reaction of what do I need in order to get this, in order to get that, but you're also managing your resident cubes, <laughs> right? That's right, yeah, the different workers. You want to make sure that they're happy. Yeah, but the thing that's neat about this game is it forces a lot of player interaction because if you don't have the industry in front of you, you have an option of basically borrowing it from another player. Mm -hmm. And so There's like a trade mechanism in the game. There's a trade mechanism that we won't go into because it's very specific <laughs> to the game, but you basically don't have to build it all yourself. You can kind of wait and see what other players are building so that you can kind of piggyback off of them in order to gain your goals. 
right? Yeah, that's exactly it. So the, it, it comes to a point where you're like, well, it took me so long to build up my industry. So I'm going to just passively use your industries. You get a benefit, but I definitely get a benefit as well. Yeah. And it's not something that you can refuse. So uh, it's it's a really, really clever mechanism in the mm-hmm. game because uh, there's no way you're going to be able to build it out. And on my first play, I thought I was going to have to build it out. But then <laughs> as you get about to the halfway point, you start to realize, oh, Monique's, Monique's building that. I don't have to worry about that at all. At right. any point, I can use uh, one of my trade tokens and just get what I need at the right time. Also, speaking of the halfway point, you also realize that these industry tiles that you're building out on your player board that you're obsessing over, they're not even the way that you score points. No. You can build out all of them if you want to and score nothing, next to nothing, because the main point of the game is every time you gain more people, you also have to acquire these cards into your hand. Those cards are the main ways in which you score points. So you're, you're basically trying to build out these industry tiles so that you have access to these specific resources that those cards are requiring. Mm-hmm. And so the card mechanism is kind of strange because in order for you to continue to to build out your engine, you need to gain more people Mm -hmm. by either upgrading your current people or by just gaining more people into your colony. And every time you gain people, you gain those cards. And that is the timer of the game. Yes, as soon as one player rids themselves of all their cards, that signifies the end of the game. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets one more turn. And then that's pretty much it. Yes. So that mechanic is kind of the one thing that's a little bit frustrating to me, besides Mm -hmm. the player count thing, which we'll get to in a second. I just want to briefly mention that there's a little bit more to the game than that. There are these like extra island boards. There are different types of actions that you can take that kind of give you more points. But that is the main heart and soul, the main mechanism of the gameplay. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's it's a really good game. Uh, We thought we were going to film a a playthrough of this. But we realized because of that trade mechanism, which we're, we're talking about, this game really shined at three players when we played it. And mm-hmm. we, the onus in a two-player game is on two people now to build out these industries yeah. to satisfy the cards that we have. I don't think there's any way to scale it down for two players. Like, there's no public um, industries that are pre-built uh, that you can then go trade from, from like, kind of a public sector. No, no. Um, y- you so can play it at two. You can, yeah. yeah. Like, But it's just not as good. Right. Um, you definitely want to play it at three or four. It's that player interaction is just so... So prevalent in the game and it's just what makes the game a lot more fun does, like yeah. there was a long time when we, pl- we played one three-player game of this mm-hmm. and um, there was one time where me and our, our other friend were assuming that Naveen was gonna build a chocolate and I was like that I was gonna I, build a chocolate factory I yeah. built several rounds of strategy based off of Naveen building the chocolate and we're like Naveen <laughs> are you gonna build this out now or what so I, I found myself in a situation where I did not have cards that required chocolate so I was like I don't have to build it out. <laughs> <laughs> because why would I build it out to help you? So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's So that part is clever, just really yeah. interesting. Like yeah. having to rely on your opponents and then ki- it's almost like it almost feels like a semi-co-op, but you're really focusing on your your board, your goals, everything. Mm-hmm. The worker management I thought was super interesting in this game. It feels quite unique. Like I don't know another game that's like Anno 1800. Yeah, it's a lot of cube conversion. It's I mean, a that, lot that's of That's primarily conversion. like what, what this game is. Um, but yes, I know what you, exactly what you mean. It, it still feels fresh. Yeah. Uh, compared to all the different kind of like turn these in to make this turn this in to get that right but that cube conversion part the fact that it is so it a lot of the times a majority of the gameplay is in that cube conversion part and that is the other reason why we could not film a playthrough of it because Mm -hmm. it would just be a lot of a lot of it it would have been like interesting (laughs) to watch sorry it it would have been like i'm taking my red worker it's going to this i'm going to make this industry your turn yeah okay, now i'm going to do this i'm going to do that okay now your turn okay now the blue worker is going to go here to get this and it would have just been that for almost two hours for almost two hours yeah, yeah. so when you're playing it when you're in it and you're strategizing and what's going on in your mm-hmm. head versus what is visually going on yeah it's completely different yeah right that, yeah yeah, what's going on in your, in your head is is a really fun, long-term strategy of planning, figuring out how to be optimal, how mm-hmm. to be efficient, how to not get so many cards in your hand, but also how to score the highest scoring cards in your hand. All that is really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does kind of run long. When I was When we were playing, it doesn't feel like it drags, but it definitely is long. When we looked back after the teach, because yeah. it, it was uh, the first time we ever played it, it was that three-player game, and the teach plus the gameplay, it felt like uh, we were not too sure how many workers to take, because every time you take workers, you get more cards, hence you're extending the gameplay. Yeah. So because somebody has to offload all their cards. So nobody knew what a good score was. We weren't mm-hmm. sure, like, 
do I need to do I need to acquire more to score more? Yeah. And then I kind of found a way to be like, I think I'm scoring well. I mean, right, I right, try to right. get rid of these cards and end it. Yeah. And then I kind of suddenly ended it on on both of them. So that that timing <laughs> mechanism yeah. where you're having to get more and more cards is a little bit frustrating for me. That's yeah. probably the one downside of like, oh God, when is this game ever going to end? Because you're just continue continuously getting more and more cards. Mm -hmm. But then it does end and. It's a great ride. Yeah, it's my so, type of Euro game. Uh, yeah. I'm a big fan of like, uh, get the cube, do this, do that, do that. You know, it's, just, it's very much like so, like a, a spreadsheet and you're mm -hmm. trying to figure out, uh, you know, what's the most optimal way to do things mm -hmm. in this game. So I, I really enjoyed it. This was actually on uh, one of my most anticipated games list. I can't remember what year, maybe 2021. A while back, yeah. yeah. So, and so we finally got to play it and uh, I really enjoyed it. But I will say we've only played this at two and three. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily know that I would want to play it. Maybe I would consider playing it at four. It just can yeah. feel long if people have analysis paralysis because you're trying to be really efficient on your turn right. and you know that there's potentially a right answer. And because of that, it might be just way too long at mm -hmm. four. Anyway, that is Anno 1800, designed by Martin Wallace. All right, moving on to the next game. This is a game that we actually did record a playthrough of. Half of Half, that. yeah. Until, uh, and this was during the time of our top-down camera fiasco where it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. So we had to scrap that playthrough, unfortunately, and then we just don't have time to film it. So... It's another long one, yeah. We're going to be talking about it today. Mm -hmm. It is... Yeah, it's none other than Bitoku, designed yes. by Herman Milan and published by Devere Games. Uh, this one is a Japanese-themed Euro game, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's beautiful. I mean, this this definitely has a big focus on art. It's Japanese themed. I think it's more Japanese lore themed. Lore, it's yeah. a little bit based off of um, Studio Ghibli art style. If you're familiar with that uh, studio that produces a lot of Japanese animated films, like Spirited Away is probably the most famous one. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the art style and world building is kind of based off of those types of works. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen this board, this is probably the busiest board of the year, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely of the games that have been released in the past two years. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, but it's quite busy. It's an entire forest scene, basically. Yep. And so you look at the game and your your mind is screaming, what is going on here, right? The first yeah. time I saw it, I was like, "What? how do you even play, is this a game? Yeah, so, so Monique taught this game to me and um, the, the very first time it was laid out, she had it all set up and like I came to the table and I was I was overwhelmed. And like I, I rarely find myself to be overwhelmed by kind of the board and the board state of what mm -hmm. I'm looking at. And mm -hmm. so the art style is just so intertwined into the mechanisms of, of the, the different action spots in the mm -hmm. game that learning the game for me initially was very, very difficult because I was just so distracted by some of the things I was seeing. Absolutely beautiful though. I will say... Rule book wise, I also had a hard time learning the game from the rule book. The rule book was also absolutely beautiful. It was just very long and kind of split into this like two parts. So I kept having to flip back and mm. forth from like the end part to the front part. And it, yeah, it was it was a tough learn. But when you actually learn the game, it's not super heavy. It no. looks like it is. Mm -hmm. It's long. It's also very, very long, but it's not super complicated. Because basically the way that the game works is you're playing it over the course of, I believe, four seasons. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember the terminology for all of the different cards because it's one of those games where everything has a name. Mm -hmm. Even rounds have their own name. Literally every mechanic in this game has its own terminology. And that also, I feel like, adds to the difficulty in learning the game. That's right. Yeah, because right? you have to not only, you know, convert in your mind, round is not considered round. It's yeah, it's like season. Yeah, yeah the, the whole game, I think, is a year, stuff mm -hmm. like that. And, and that's, uh, that's like not bad for terminology, but, sure. but all the yeah. different cards <laughs> right, are right. called things, right? Like right. what's a Bitoku card versus a something else card? A yokai. Card? Or a something yokai, like that. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you look at the board, the board is split into five different regions. And that is really all you need to know mm -hmm. about how to take your turn. Because on your player board itself, your player board is also divided into three different sections. And on your turn, you're playing a, I think it's a yokai card. I think so. Yeah. From your your hand right. onto one of those three uh, sections of your board, unlocking the die that is placed next to it. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you have unlocked the die, then you can place the die onto the main board. One of the action into, locations. Yeah, exactly. Into one of those five different regions that requires you to place dice. And then when you place the die there, you just take the action, depending on how strong of, of, of a die the you place the, the, the value of the pip. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be things like collecting resources, building out buildings, which you can place into those five different regions so that whenever pl people place out their dice there, they can activate those buildings as well. Mm -hmm. You're getting these extra uh, stones or dragonflies to place onto your player board. You're moving your piece up the pathway at the top of the board as well as on your little Bitoku 
map that you're kind of building out on on your own player board. Mm -hmm. At some point during the round, if you have a die placed in one of those regions, you can also choose to move it across the river mm -hmm. to gain another benefit. And so all those those combination of three things that I just mentioned, you're basically doing a combination of that for all three placements on your player board over the course of one round. Right. The order in which you do that is up to you. Um, but the first thing that absolutely has to happen is you have to unlock those dice before you can place the dice onto the main board. Mm -hmm. And that's it. You do you do all that four times for over the course of four rounds, and that's the entire game technically. Mm -hmm. And so strategy-wise, rules-wise, it's not super heavy. No, because yeah, once you understand the kind of like the, the outline as to where everything is on yeah. the board and just the mechanism of play a card, unlock the dice, use that dice to then go take an action. Yeah. If I want, after that dice is there, I can move it across the river. And that's essentially the three things are the three steps for the different types of actions you're going to be taking mm -hmm. in the game. And then once you learn exactly what the five different regions do and what each of the mechanisms they're tied to do, mm -hmm. then you have the whole game. Yep. And so you're basically trying to, to acquire your own end game scoring conditions mm -hmm. and then spending the entire game meeting those end game <laughs> scoring right. conditions. Exactly so it. like if I get a stone that says you get one point for every type of this card, well now I'm going to spend the entire game trying to get as many of those types of cards as I can. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I acquire cards that'll increase the path that I'm, that I'm going on on my board yep. that'll help me score points at the end of the game depending on set collection. I don't know. It's one of those games. It's like a point salad There's game. There's several paths can, to victory. Several paths and so, to victory. So yeah, to you're going to want to take like two paths and be like, I'm going to run with these hard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because there are several paths to victory, I think that part is interesting. Mm -hmm. The game just runs really long for, for what it is for me. Yeah, we played a four player game and because everybody is going to take all these actions, uh, up, upwards of I think like nine, nine. actions yeah. per round. A four player game ran really long. Like three hours yeah. more. We enjoyed more. the company, we enjoyed the time playing it, but it was just really, really long yeah. at that point where it's like, okay, another round. Uh, I, I felt like that fourth season was mm -hmm. like was like way too much at a four player game. And because of that, I would never play this at four mm -hmm. ever again, mm -hmm. right? For me, this is gonna be two or three. It's just one of those, those games where I don't feel like the time put in justified what was going on while we were playing. Sure, yeah. Like it didn't feel like I was building up a big engine and like, oh my gosh, I better take that because they're gonna take that. There were, there were no decisions that were really like pressing for me. Mm -hmm. So, I felt like the decisions were very straightforward. Like, of yeah. course, I would take that because I have this end game scoring condition that, that okay. would give me two points yeah. for taking it. I know? think the most the the thing is for the worker placement spots. Sometimes that you know you can get hosed out on something, and so you're like, I really want to play this next yokai card to yeah. unlock the die, but right. I've already played one previously, and if I don't use this die right now to go to that spot, I could get blocked out. Yeah. Uh, so that is true. the one thing that the, the competition for locations does get more interesting and and, and uh, more challenging at a higher player count, especially. And for that reason, it's probably a three-player game in my mind because mm -hmm. at two players, you lose out on this rule um, that says there's a rule in higher player counts where you cannot place a die in a region. I'm, I'm forgetting the rule now. It's yeah. like your die has to be equal to or higher than. I think so. Yeah. Than the the highest place die. It's about that the region. value of the pips, yeah, relative to the to the die so that's already there. Yes, and that rule is gone in a two-player game yeah. because there's just not enough competition for mm -hmm. that to really matter. Mm -hmm. And so it is interesting at more than two. Just too long at four. Yeah, I, I also do like the mechanism in the game, though. Uh, so we talked about the yokai card gets played. You place a die out into one of the uh, regions below the river. Mm -hmm. That clogs up one of the spaces below the river. But if you can time it right and you know Monique is probably going to move her die off that river, so I'll withhold and wait till she clears out, changing the value of the pips that yeah, are there, yeah. meaning now my value, my value die can now actually go here and take yeah. the action. Right. And I thought that was really, really cool in the game. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good. But we do know that there are a lot of people out there who really love this game. <laughs> And if you're a person who is really drawn to games based off of their component quality and just the aesthetic look, I know that there are gamers out there who really, the, the look of the game can really add to their enjoyment value, yep. then this is maybe a game that you might want to check out because the components are so beautiful. The resources, just everything, they definitely um, made sure that it was the highest quality game that they mm -hmm. could put out. Totally, yeah. Uh, I will note, just kind of like Anno 1800 setup time for this can be quite a bit. Oh my gosh. Uh, so if you are a big fan of this or if this does interest you, I would look into some sort of insert or some sort of organization for it. Big time. Mm -hmm. I open the box and it gives me anxiety. It's it's <laughs> just a lot of a components. Lot in there. Yeah. That is Bitoku. Bitoku. <laughs> Finally, we were able to talk we about it. We talked about it. All right, next up is another game that we've been trying to talk about for a long time, mm -hmm. but hadn't been able to because of the required amount of players. Yes, right? yeah, this is one that I definitely want to play at four or more. Yes. And so this is none other than Betrayal at House on the Hill, the third, third edition, edition designed by Bruce Glasgow and published by Avalon Hill. 
Uh, this is the third iteration of this game. Monique and I have played the second edition. Yes, We've never only. played the original one. We've never played any of the other ones. Yeah. So because of that, okay, we do have a caveat. Um, this is not going to be an in-depth review. Mm -hmm. We haven't been able to play this version that many times. Uh, it, and you just cannot give you know, a super in-depth review without playing a bunch of the scenarios in this because it is a game that is scenario-based. Right, right. And uh, we literally have only played this one and second edition. We mm -hmm. haven't played the first edition, Legacy, or I think there's like a Scooby-Doo. There are other versions there's of other Betrayal ones, yeah. out there. Yep. But we were very excited to be able to play this because uh, the second edition is a game that we both, oh, I don't know, did you like that one? It was on our Games We Regret Getting Rid Of uh, video that we did maybe about a year ago. I can't yeah. remember when we released I it. I really loved Betrayal at the House yeah. Hill. I didn't care if it was broken. I was, I'm one Same. of those gamers who was like, you know what? Whatever. Whatever. Yeah. We, the whole gameplay could just be ruined and we could lose for no reason. <laughs> I would still have a good time. Because then you just laugh because, about it. Yeah, because yeah, it's, it's one of those experience games. It's about yeah. what happens at the table, how it brings you together, and and like what it forces you to do mm -hmm. that I think is is really fun about the system as yeah. a whole. Not yeah. necessarily this edition or the second edition, but just the idea of the game in general. Yeah, if you're right? not familiar with it, you're going to be playing as asymmetric characters who are all working together to explore this haunted house. The characters are only asymmetric in their uh, starting abilities. Like yeah. You have like four different types of uh, like strength, characteristics, speed, yeah, yeah, that characteristics. kind of help you and dictate yeah. like what you can do in the game. Exactly. And that's yeah. the only thing that's asymmetric. Yeah, so you're, you're essentially um, building out this house by exploring different rooms, getting haunted and spooked by different little uh, things that can happen within those rooms, uh, and then eventually at some point, once a certain thing triggers uh, something called the haunt, one of the players is going to betray everybody else, and they mm -hmm. are going to now have their own win condition, and the group is going to have their own win condition. It's actually a lot more exciting than that, because you spend a majority of the early game building up your character. You want to make your character as strong as possible, because you don't know who around the table is going to be the betrayer. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to collect items, you're trying to just beef up your stats, so that when you go to when you need to get into a fight, then you have all this you know stuff that you can work with in your arsenal. Yeah, you're also building out the house in a yes. kind of... In a, in kind of a strategic way where it's like, okay, if I'm on the good guys team and mm -hmm. I'm not being betrayed, I need to leave ways in and out of room so I don't get just trapped in a room with the, yeah. with the bad guy. Yeah, there is the, the, a big part of the game is building out the mansion out, yeah. at the, the start of the game. And then at some point, like Naveen said, a haunt happens mm -hmm. and somebody becomes a betrayer. You give the betrayer their own betrayer handbook. Everybody else is on the opposite team and they get that one handbook and you mm -hmm. all turn to the same case and you separately read what you have to do. And each side has their own uh, win, win condition, condition essentially, yeah. and their own like rule set. That And that is what is broken. And I'm not actually putting that in quotations, it is broken. Yeah. Like the, the other versions of the game, some of the cases are just like, the rule set of the main game doesn't accommodate some of the cases. The situations that the situations, can happen. Yeah. Or, or they're just vague, and then you end up being in this situation where it's like, well, I, this could never happen. There's no pro proper ending for this, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that was what was wrong with the previous editions. And you can also just probably from hearing that description, if you've never played the game before, you could probably imagine why a game like that would be a little bit problematic mm -hmm. to execute, right? It's, it's because tough to do, yeah. Because all of the cases are, are unique. Like they're all different stories mm -hmm. and there are so many. It's just impossible. It's impossible to play test every single one of those to make it perfectly right. Yeah, because like right? it's like the house has to be at least this much built out by the time the haunt happens to make sure everyone's beefed up this much. Yeah. And then still attacks happen on a die roll. So yes, then yes. things, you know, things there, it's gonna be very difficult. But that's part of the the broken kind of uh, strange things that happen is what for me makes this game fun. Uh, I know a lot of <laughs> you people, like the fact that it's broken. Yeah, I do. I, I don't mind. Like it's like ah, oh, I need to roll a six. And, like that's the one in six chance, and I roll a six. Like that's awesome. We we also probably it's it's probably very likely that we haven't run across the super broken scenarios from the previous iterations that sure. really made people angry. So take that, take all of that with a grain of salt. But uh, speaking on the third edition specifically, they did make some changes, some slight changes. You know, they they weren't that dramatic, mm -hmm. but they did make some. Changes changes to try to accommodate for uh, previous errors in the other editions. They made some component changes. First of all, I want to mention that the artwork is different. Mm -hmm. uh, the artwork on this game in particular is much darker. darker. Yeah. The, the house artwork, for some people, some people might like that because maybe it gives like a more of a horror feel to it. I liked the other edition version yeah. better. I don't, I, I just felt like it muddied the tiles. I don't know. 
I, maybe I'm Just weird. looking down at the table after yeah. it was all built out. It's like, oh, yeah. it's really kind of macabre. I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the theme of it, so I'm assuming that's probably why they did it. It's, it's neither here or there for me. The yeah. art, I, I think it, it, either way is fine for me. Yeah, they also tried to improve upon the sliders because in the original game, um, mm. each player's uh, token or each player's sheet, character sheet that yeah. kind of houses those four statistics, you keep track of them using these like plastic sliders that they don't stay. This is in the old one. The old one. Yes. Yeah. So they, they made those sliders tighter. I, I was hoping that they would just change that. Yeah. That system of keeping track of those things, but they didn't. It's the same thing. Yeah, you know, I thought I thought personally that what should have been done is just like a, a square sheet where you have like cubes that you just plop in and yeah. go up and down. You know, like when you when you turn them into like that diagonal kind of thing, and then they're just kind of recess boards. I thought that would have been better because even these sliders, they're kind of like hard now. They almost like overdid it. Yeah, they're yeah. really tight. And yeah. so the first time we played, Naveen, you you pulled it out and you're like, oh, this is going to destroy this. This in is going to destroy this right? cardboard if I, over if we time. We play this game a ton. Yeah, like this is going to destroy this. Mm. So it's just pinching a little too hard. Yeah, in our copy, it's better. But it is quite tight. Mm -hmm. They also changed the way that the haunts are structured. So in the second edition, if I'm rem remembering correctly, there was a booklet and you kind of turn to this chart and it's mm -hmm. like, which omen did somebody have when the haunt was triggered and who who triggered, triggered it? it and then it tells else. you based off that chart who is going to be the betrayer and what case to turn to. Right. In this game, there's a little bit more of a thematic integration. There are, I think, like five scenario cards and on each card is one background story that links all of the cases on that card right. to each other right, right. so that you'll have a more of a fluid uh, story. I thought that was a neat idea for people out there who are interested in the game because of the RPG elements, the storytelling, um, then maybe you, you might like that method better. Sure. The way that the haunt is triggered is different now. So I believe the way that it was before is that was that when somebody collected an omen, you roll six dice. And if the the sum of the die values was less than the number of omens at mm -hmm. the table, then that would trigger the haunt. So then the more omens you get, you know, the higher ch the chances of you triggering the haunt. Now in this version of the game, you roll one die for every omen that's around the table. So the first time somebody collects an omen, you only mm -hmm. roll one die. And uh, if ever you, I believe, reach five, a sum of five or higher, then mm -hmm. the haunt begins. Yeah. And, and so, these die, the pip values only go up to two. Yeah, yeah. they're one or two and mm -hmm. some of them are blanks. Mm -hmm. So the first couple of times, it's going to be impossible, which I think is good because it does make the first two times that you get an omen card like, an for impossibility. For sure not going to happen, yeah. But uh, it's still not perfect. You know, one of the gameplays that we played, it totally backfired it on did. us, on Naveen, actually. It, yeah, I became the betrayer. <laughs> uh, the haunt triggered way faster <laughs> Yes, than it should have for way our particular scenario. I don't want to ruin anything about any scenarios, but in that particular game, we experienced the brokenness, I guess you can call it, but I still had a really good time with it. It was, it was awful. It was, because, <laughs> uh, it was because the haunt started way sooner than it was supposed to, yes. and uh, the scenario that we were playing was kind of dependent on, a on big the house. size of the house. Yes. And we're not saying which one or what happened in, in the scenario. Let's just say the house was not that big and <laughs> Naveen was like clearly going to lose this game. My win condition relative to the size of the house, relative to what their win condition was as the people who were not part of the betraying group yeah. uh, was just uh, the combination at the timing was not right. Had, yeah. the, had the haunt happened a couple uh, omens later, it, it would have totally it been, been way yeah. better. It would have yeah. been way different. And so to add insult to injury, we also just were rolling perfect, <laughs> perfect, <laughs> die perfect die rolls. And when I would roll, time. the exact opposite. It was just like, whoa. So yeah. I, I, I felt bad like playing the rest of this game because it was basically like us just like smiling and laughing yeah. as you're running past Naveen. I'm glad it was me as a betrayer because for me, I have yeah. a no hearts feeling yeah. approach whenever I play this game. So I was like, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I it just was, want to see what happens. It was fine in the end, but it yeah. definitely, we definitely ended the game way too early. Yeah. So, you know, even though I think that that rule change is better, it's still not a perfect situation, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it can be for a game like this. It um, happens. And speaking of the scenarios, by the way, the, the information is a lot more open in this game, mm -hmm. which I think is good and bad. Like in the old game, you couldn't say anything about your case from what I remember. Or maybe yes. we just played it that way, but like the betrayer would read their rule book and it's kind of like, I really hope you're understanding like your you rule book right. You have to pick right. up, yeah, on like, what I'm doing. Not everybody is comfortable learning rules from reading a rule book and it kind of requires you to as a betrayer. Yeah, especially as the, yeah, the betrayer, like yeah. you cannot consult now with everybody else like, hey, I don't quite understand this. Can you help me out with yeah, this? As the betrayer, can't. it's like, figure it out. Like, yeah. this is it. So um, in this version, uh, if you do something, 
you can ask them like, wait, now why are you doing that? Yeah. And then you have to reveal. They're actually required to read the line from mm-hmm. their case book uh, that has to do with what they're doing. Yeah. So I you're think, always a good thing. allowed to clarify. Yeah. yeah, it is a good thing because yeah. it, it. I think that is another attempt at making it less broken. If everybody around the table understands what is supposed to be happening in this case, yeah. then the possibilities of it being broken are probably smaller. Exactly, yeah. But uh, it, you do lose out a little bit of that mystery. I, I really like that, like, what is this guy doing? This, like... What he's like behaving in a weird way. Gosh, I just need to I just need to stick to to my win condition. Yeah, and then you know try to see. Yeah, I will say as the betrayer with that extra information, I knew what they were up to mm-hmm. very early on, yeah. and I was like, nothing I can do about this other than attempt what my win condition is. But there was just no chance. Mm-hmm. And other than that, there are also some other really minor rule changes that have to do with the way that turns work. But that is pretty much the main differences. Yep. And so to me, it feels pretty much the same. <laughs> or not that, you know, you, you do feel the differences a little bit. Yeah. You also feel the differences in the writing. Yes. But it's not a huge difference between this version and the second edition. Uh, if you're thinking about switching, I would I would recommend this for people who have never played any of the Betrayal games. Sure. If you're going to get into it, get into it with the third edition. Might as well. If you just want more cases, more variety of cases, then also get the third edition. Mm-hmm. But if you still have the second edition at home and you haven't played through a ton of it, play through that. Yep. And so that's it. That is Betrayal at House on the Hill, third edition. Yep. All right, moving on to the last title of the day. This is a game that is not quite as heavy as mm-hmm. the first two on the list, but one that is that we're really excited to talk about. Yeah, this is none other than Pessoa, designed yeah. by Orlando Sa and published by Pythagoras. They are a Portuguese company. Yes. Um, they've also done Cafe, which is a game that we were really, really game fans of. we really love. Yes, yeah. and also uh, Porto was another one that we enjoyed when we played it at Essen. Yeah, and so this is a game that is based off of a poet, mm-hmm. a really famous uh, Portuguese. Portuguese poet yep. by the name of Fernando Pessoa. And so uh, I believe the thing that is unique and very, very interesting about uh, him as a poet is his use of heteronyms, which is a concept that we just learned yeah. in playing this game. Mm-hmm. One of our really good friends actually taught us this game, and he explained the concept of the heteronyms as him having almost like different poets in his head that he would write. Yeah, uh, right he would using? write about different subject matter and different styles for each of these different heteronyms or these yeah. different uh, kind of characters that he had built up in his mind. Yeah, so it's the same poet, but different people that he's writing under with totally different styles. Exactly. So I thought that was super cool, yeah, very right? Like what a yeah. really beautiful artistic way to express yourself. Mm-hmm. And so this game is is pretty much a play on that. So you have this main board in the middle. It's mainly a worker placement game. Mm -hmm. And everybody plays as a different heteronym. The main purpose of the game is you're constructing poetry. Mm -hmm. And the poetry is in the form of these cards. Each card has an excerpt from one of his poems. And you're basically set collecting. You're trying to get uh, ascending numbers of cards Mm -hmm. to turn them in to form a poem. Each card is one of uh, three different suits. And the suits are the colors. They they have to do with the type of poetry that he was writing. People have different abilities depending on which heteronym they are. But the basic concept of the worker placement, which is one of the unique parts of the game, is there's only one space per area where you can place your worker. And so if, say, Naveen has placed a worker in an area that I want to go to, it's completely blocked out. My options are I can spend a resource to basically embody Fernando Peso himself, which is a different meeple. Right. And then I can go and place that that token on a spot that's specifically reserved for his meeple only. Yeah, there's, there's only two spots per different uh, action location. Yeah. And one of those two spots is if you have the Pessoa meeple itself. Yeah. So there comes a time where you're like, okay, I need to like become Pessoa so I can take this specific action. Mm-hmm. Alternatively, if Pessoa's uh, meeple is already at that location, I can go into the middle, which is a metaphysical space mm-hmm. that lets me activate the location. Location, location of where, where his token is already is exactly yeah so that is kind of the unique uh, worker placement part of it um, other than that you're you're doing things like mainly gaining cards in two of the regions one region allows you to actually build the poem and then the th- the fourth region just allows you to kind of build up an engine of sorts mm-hmm. there's a little bit of astrology that has to do with timing as to when you're taking actions which round yeah because there's 12 rounds in the game and yeah. there's kind of this wheel that turns and certain astrological signs are going to be in these different pie shapes that mm-hmm. are the that correspond to the different locations. So if you were to turn in cards that have the same astrological symbol on it Mm -hmm, in that location when it's lined up just right, you get a benefit, which is always something you're trying to time. So that adds a little bit more to the strategy of the game. That's the basic concept of the game. It's kind of hard to describe also without it being in front of you because Mm -hmm. this is another unique uh, unique experience. Yep. There's also an advanced variant where you can have basically these end game scoring cards, mm-hmm. but the, the way in which you play them 
is kind of unique, right? Yeah, you play I, a card, then you have to you have to draft them. Draft them, yeah. Afterwards, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's called the advanced variant. I would highly recommend playing with that as yeah. your first play experience. With play with it. Yes. If if you're a seasoned gamer, um, because it it adds a little bit extra, especially with the card drafting. It's like when you acquire these end game scoring cards, you can actually look out and say like, I don't want to pass this to Monique because mm -hmm. she unknowingly is working towards this card. So yeah. then you have to have a decision point of like. I guess I have to hold on to this because yeah. this is going to score her a bunch of points. So here, here's another card that you know you're going to have to take. So yeah, it adds a little those. element right there. Mm -hmm. Also, this game scales very well at two, three, and four. You mm -hmm. just basically put uh, kind of like dummy blockers, so all yeah. the action spots are going to still be as competitive in any of the player counts. Right. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's a fairly light game. Um, it is more of a casual game for me. Uh, it's nothing that like I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, like I need to get that yellow one, <laughs> otherwise yeah. this is going to ruin everything for me. Um, so it, it's yellow. kind of like a like it's <laughs> oh, a good like conversational game. You can be hanging out with your friends, you know, playing a card, taking mm -hmm. an action, being like, oh shoot, Monique went there. Okay, ding. How, how do I pivot? And then you just go right back into yeah. the, kind of your conversation. So right. it's it's lighter. I think this is a game that I'm probably going to want to play with my family, with my parents, mm -hmm. uh, because I think they could they could understand the concepts here and and still enjoy themselves. And how about yourself? Yeah, I actually thought that the game was was really interesting. It's uh, it is on the lighter end. It's not it's not super heavy, but it is it feels quite unique. You know, the worker placement part of it feels different. It feels fresh. Um, that is probably the tightest part of it for me. Mm -hmm. Like figuring out how to get what I need to do uh, with the resources that I have, because you have these like creativity that you're spending as resources. Yeah, we didn't mention this. Also, turn order matters. Whoever is Pessoa is going to be going first, so yes. you can go from first to going last. Mm -hmm quick like mm -hmm. because somebody took Pessoa. Yes, that's true. So that, that part of it is interesting to me. I just think that the main mechanism of the game, which is set collection of the cards and turning them in for points, is not the most interesting mm -hmm. for a few reasons. I, I felt like it's just not that hard to get the cards. Yeah. There are two locations that get you cards and they get you cards in different ways. And I always kind of just had the cards that I needed. Yeah, because if, you, if you're like, well, I need gray and there's some there and I have the opportunity to mm -hmm. take it. That'll be my action. I'll go take the cards. Yeah, and on the yeah. other hand, when you can see, because there is a fourth location on the left-hand side here that you can utilize that'll help build up your board to make certain cards worth more points, mm -hmm. because there is some asymmetry in the way that you score your poetry, depending on which heteronym you are. Mm -hmm. And so that part it is also hard to stop people from, like once they built up their engine, and it's like, oh shoot, well Naveen is gonna score four points for every purple card, stop him. Mm -hmm. You can't stop him. You can't do it. He's yeah. gonna get all the purple cards he needs mm -hmm. because of that taking of the cards. Mm -hmm. But I really like the timing on the game. It's very fast. It does not overstay its welcome at all. And what the thing that I really, really like about this game is the theme. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is so beautiful. The art style, every single card has a piece of poetry on it. And it's both in English and in Portuguese, yes. which I totally think that the translation gets lost in English. Probably. It makes me want to learn, you know, Portuguese just the so I can... of what is truly being said yeah, in Portuguese. Just yeah. so I can read it the way it was written yeah. and experience it the way it was meant to be experienced but um, it's just so beautiful. If you're into, you know, games that have cultural expression in them or, you know, Portuguese games especially, mm -hmm. then this is definitely one that you should check out yep. because it's just so beautiful. And mm -hmm. it does it does play fairly uniquely. And so overall, this is kind of a, a in the middle of a game for me. It's mm -hmm. not the most exciting. It's not one that kind of screams off my shelf, but yep. it's definitely one that we'd love to keep around for a little bit longer just because it's so quick to play. And it is, it's a it's an interesting experience it, it's for sure. It's art in itself. Yeah, it's art mm -hmm. in itself, exactly. Yep. And so that is Pessoa. All right, well, that is it for today's episode. Uh, we really hope you enjoy the games that we discussed today. We're going to be doing more of these, you know, as the summer kind of... Presses on. Presses on, yeah. I guess. Keep on, keep keep on, on keeping on, right? Summer. We have a lot of games that we have to talk about that have been waiting, I guess, for us to talk they're, about them. They're ready for another Let's Talk Board Game segment, that's yes. for sure. And so if you have any recommendations for games to play, I am still on my mission to play as many board games as possible during the summer, mm -hmm. especially since I am doing this full time now. Please feel free to leave them in the comments below. And of course, let us know if you've played any of the games that we talked about today. Let us know how you feel about them. And uh, we'll see you later. Thank you all so much for watching the video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, please consider subscribing. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.